The second concerto is written, of course, in 38, 1938, in his final period of composing, when Bartok was already kind of looking back on everything he had been producing through his whole lifetime. So the first period where the first concerto comes from was of course a very romantically influenced period. We hear in the first movement of the first concerto a bit of Wagner. We hear Strauss and Liszt in the second movement. Then comes a long period where he actually in, in explores all his folk music researches and tries to put them into his music and also, of course, becomes much more modern and radical in his way of writing. And then in this later period where the second violin concerto was written in, we have this, um, like, uh, a way of trying to combine and harmonize with all those different styles and, um, and, and different periods of composers and, and music. And we have lots of influences. We have a quite a romantic influence again. We have the rhythmical and um, harsh influence of the middle period. We have uh, we have the folk music uh, music um, right at the beginning of the concerto. The first movement has a so-called verbunkos theme, which comes right from the from the Hungarian. Uh, folk music, of course. We have dodecaphonie, we have tw uh, 12 tone, uh, very elegantly and, and almost tonally integrated in this concerto. So he, I think he tries to combine everything and not necessarily look for yet another new, new um, invention. But um, all, of, all of this integrated in, in a classical three movement form and yet not so classical because actually at the beginning he wanted to only make a, a variation movement and the violinist uh, Sekei who asked and paid for this piece said no I would like to have a real violin concerto like in the style of Brahms and Beethoven we need th three movements and um, and he even influenced the end of the of this piece which Bartok had first written so that the orchestra was ending alone and the violinist stopped before. And um, Sekei said, no, 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 I would like to really play till the very end and show off, so, so I have my big applause. So Bartok also changed that, but for the variation, he was actually outwitting him and he also writes it in a letter. He said, ah, you see, in the end, I did write my variations because actually the second movement is entirely written in the form of variations. And the third movement is completely a variation of the first movement. So it's a kind of classically looking concerto, but with lots of different influences. Is Isabel is a, a fascinating person, a musician. Um, she is the most thorough and, and uh, her ideas, her, her, the detail, um, the thoughtfulness with which she approaches the music um, is, quite, is quite astonishing. She has this ability to look at something, I feel, for what it is, uncluttered by, by, by uh, um, you know, noise from the outside. She, she, she sees straight to the heart of something. There's an incredible honesty um, about the way she plays. She proposes something and you really have to work to find your way to, to, to see it the way she sees it. But every time you arrive there you think, why didn't I see this before? <laughs> Daniel Harding is a very wonderful young colleague who has already a lot of experience but is still a very young conductor. and very much searching and I don't mean that negatively but absolutely positively. I, I uh, appreciate most of all colleagues who are always searching and try to come even deeper in the sense of the com composer and the composition and um, he's 
a musician with a lot of depth, who never takes things too lightly, who always gives his very last strength and force and energy to make a performance be a success and be um, a very intense and fresh music making on, on stage. What I like very much in the way Isabel approaches the piece is she's constantly trying to unearth what it is that makes something unusual. I've been playing this concerto since, since a long time. I've had a long break also with this piece. So I could come back now for this recording with a very fresh looking and hearing ear and eye. And um, I, I just uh, have always loved this piece. I think it's an incredibly vital, full of energy, full of rhythmical energy, but also incredibly lyrical. It, it actually has all the ingredients you need for, for a successful performance. The first concerto has had a very difficult story. It's been written by young Bartok in 1907 as a big, big uh, homage, love letter to his uh, adore Steffi Geyer, um, a young Hungarian violinist who was already quite famous at that moment. And Ma unfortunately, she was right at that moment when the piece finished, when he already had finished writing this piece, she wrote him a letter and uh, telling him that actually she, she wanted to finish this relationship. So she, um, he, yeah, she still wanted to, <laughs> to see the piece and she got it, but she never wanted to play it. We, uh, we've been working a couple of days here on this and, uh, and uh, Isabel has been spending months now researching and, and, and looking and uh, sending emails with thoughts. There are many different sources, there are many questions um, in these two concertos uh, just about the text. That's been fascinating, the, the amount of time she spent looking at that and the things she kept discovering and throwing out and she would find little comments Bartok had said and she would send them to me and that always changes something the, the way you think. Bartok never heard this piece in, in his entire form of two movements being performed. It's only been performed in 58 uh, by the violinist Schneeberger and Paul Sacher conducting. But he heard the first movement, which has been the, back then uh, put together with another completely different movement for orchestra into a new opus, which is called Tomb Portraits. And this first movement was called The Ideal. So actually the first movement is showing Steffi Geyer in the most idealistic way. And, and this movement has been premiered uh, with Bartok also assisting to the, to the rehearsals. And we have also sources existing of the material being used by that violinist back then, Imre Waldbauer. And we even have his fingerings and we have some comments by Bartok on that edition. I suppose I start to feel like a, an adolescent. I've had quite a lot of experience, and that's a wonderful thing. But um, but uh, the more you the more you develop, the more you grow. Of course, the more you become aware how how difficult it is. I do think that uh, he's it's very special to work together with him because he puts so much energy also in developing an interpretation together and to not only bring different point of views on stage, but to actually mix those point of views together so that something really special and only those musicians that day on stage can, can, uh, can produce and that there is no, no routine ever to be installed. It's an inspiration and an education always to work with her. The Swedish Radio Orchestra is an incredibly 
energetic and um, and attentive and very eager to make the most out of the music group. It's the first time I've been collaborating with them and uh, it's been a pure pleasure. Everybody has been asked a lot and in very little time and everybody had to be very, very quick and um, every second counted in this recording. But I think we all had had a lot of emotions involved in this music and especially with the first concerto, which nobody knew so as well as the second concerto. We've all discovered new worlds and we, we've all fallen in love with this piece very much. Thank you. 